Welcome to another episode of the Dentology Podcast, where we discuss the business of dentistry. In this podcast series, we'll be discussing all the non-clinical aspects of dentistry, from goodwill values, finance, marketing, how to buy and sell a dental practice mindset, through to where you can invest your money in team management issues. My name is Andy Acton, and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Strevens. Let's jump straight into it. So welcome everybody to our latest episode of Dentology, the Business of Dentistry podcast. And today we're joined by Henry Strevens. And Henry Strevens is a history graduate, a suffering, some would say long-suffering Arsenal fan. Um, hey ho. And also our business manager at Frank Taylor and Associates. Welcome Henry, how are you doing? Morning gentlemen, thank you for having me on. Hi, so Henry. Let, let's kick off, full disclosure, I've known Henry since he was five years old. Um, he's the son of my business partner and co-host, Chris. Uh, and I have a full disclosure, uh, I've known Henry since he was born. Exactly, look at that. There, so we, go. See, there we go. He's very well known to us. But before we get on to, you know, you're going to share with us some tips on how to successfully buy a dental practice. But rolling back, you did a degree in history. What, what was the background to that? Have you always been into history? Was it a passion? Was it just something you, you fell into? Yeah, so I, I know I wanted to go to uni, um, but I didn't really have a particular career path I wanted to go down. I just loved history since well, as long as I can remember. I could remember when I was younger, there used to be a history show called Battlefield Britain, and it was Dan Snow and his dad, Peter Snow, going around the UK, and it was on at nine o'clock, so I could never watch it. But what I'd do is dad would watch it, and he'd have the front door open, he'd have the living room door open, and the stairs in the old house, if you sat on a certain stair, you could look straight through the door into the TV. I would sneak downstairs, and I must have been six or seven, sit on the stairs, watch the show while Dad was watching it. And then as soon as he finished, I'd scuttle upstairs back into bed. So it's, it's always been a passion of mine. Did, 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 did your father know about this? <laughs> Fully attentive parenting, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your interest in history was from a very young age then? Yeah, I, I just found it, I find it fascinating. It's, it sounds cheesy, but it's the story of me, it's the story of you. You know, you go back in history, you know, so you've got recent history, but even you know, so far back to you know, um, the kings in the past and how England was created and all these you know, really entertaining things like Alfred the Great, you know, he was the first person who coined the term England. You know, mm. he loses to the Vikings or the Danish and then we might look more like Norway. So I think those little things are fascinating in history. And mm. I just think, yeah, you know, it's just a real passion of mine. So I thought, well, I want to go to uni because I want the history lifestyle. If I'm going to spend three years doing something, I want to do something I enjoy. So mm. I did history with a bit of politics and you yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Might have needed a bit of it. What's quite tough. intriguing is how things are changing because you're sort of mid-twenties and you went to uni to do a degree with no career, clear, or sorry, clear career path in your mind. So it wasn't like you studied law to become a lawyer or mm. veterinary science to become a vet, but you wanted to go to uni for the uni experience. Whereas I think in a f just those few years, you know, we're only rolling forward, say, five or six years, I don't think there's, there's quite that desire and urgency for people to go to uni like they did when when you went to uni. And in that, that short period of time, it's changed quite dramatically. Yeah, it might be partly to do with the huge, great student debt you take on. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is true, yeah. Well, I, I, my view of student debt is I have debt, but the answer is I'm, I'll pay off it in bits and then eventually it'll get wiped off, so I'm not that concerned about it in the grand scheme of things. But I think you're right in the fact of, you know, I had my two older sisters went to uni so Glotty when we my young my older sister went when he was less you know and I think yeah absolutely right when you're younger when you're 18 as well the school's really <laughs> pushing it but I think now you have so many more apprenticeships and other opportunities and I also think somehow slightly the uni because there's so many choices now of courses it's almost kind of lost its you know, everyone has a degree kind of now, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a degree not as fancy maybe as it used to be. But I just wanted the lifestyle. I really wanted to go to uni, live away, have a good time, you know, have that lifestyle. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, I need to pick something I'm going to I need to enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. Also, with history, you only have to do five hours a week in uni. So <laughs> that was pretty good as well. But I won't lie. <laughs> well, you had five hours a week contact time. In well, third year was eight hours a week, but I only went to five. Oh, blimey! Three. How did you cope so working working for eight yeah. hours a week? Do so, me. so struggled. You know, having to go to a lecturer. 
10 o'clock on <laughs> a Tuesday morning. Oh, life was just terrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. I knew about that. I did. <laughs> It'll be interesting if I learned some things. Here. It would be. It and, would and his be. greatest thing was that when, when he started working, he was really surprised that he, he hadn't realised quite how cushy school and university was, really. But I think there is there is no doubt that there's a there's a shift and there's a change that, that comes with adjusting to work. And I know that yeah. through COVID, um, I mean, I know that we all continue to work all the way through. But for some people who were furloughed, having that that months of, of time not working to a, a, a schedule of kind of you know up starting work at eight nine o'clock finishing at five mm. six we, we had to bring some people back into the business on a stage basis to to kind of get them ready back to work mm-hmm. because you just lose that that rhythm of working i know when we've had people join the team and it's perhaps been their first job for the first few weeks they're exhausted mm. Because it's just that, you know, doing, you know, 40, 45 hours a week, whatever yeah. it is, on, a, on an ongoing thinking, basis. Yeah. I think people forget how, yeah. how tiring thinking is of doing yeah. stuff. I mean, they're just, yeah. you know, it's a job, isn't it? But actually, if you, if you have to think about mm. it, it's tiring itself. And you'd be travelling and stuff like it's that. It's a lot of independent thinking, I find, as well. Because at uni, okay, your contact hours are really short. There's a lot of energy, but yeah. you'd be able, if you've got, you can get past it, say, five hours a week, you're not going to burn out. School, okay, you go to school for how many hours a week? But a lot of the time you're just taking on information. Mm. And then it's only when it comes to exams, you have to process. I think work is that thing of, you know, I found it really odd in the fact of I'd come from uni where, you know, my Christmas ends, my Christmas begins on the 12th of December and I don't go back until the 10th of January and then I have two weeks of refreshers week, which is just basically party. So for me, that was a real culture shock, you know, and then yeah. May, you, you essentially get all of May off. <clears> and I think you go into work and you suddenly have, you say you're working 45 hours a week, but also you've got it's and it's okay. Like, hey, here's your job. You actually need to be independently doing stuff. You're not just gonna, mm. you're not here just to take on information. Mm. You know, it, there's that responsibility and yeah. everything. And I think it is completely different to anything you've ever really done in the past, mm. unless you've worked before before going. Which I never. I did the odd job here and there. You know, did a week as a builder, a couple a week as a plumber, like like an apprenticeship, but not really doing too much. But like, I never really had like a proper job before Frank Taylor's. So that mm. was a real shock for me. Um, and also, I think for us, yeah, our, our work is primarily admin-based, it's conversation-based, it's, it's not the intensity to the extent that our audience, primarily being dentists, is. Because they're in a, a clinical environment where they're using high-speed drills, you know, in someone's mouth, you know, there's arteries, there's veins, there's, 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 there's all sorts all going physical on. physical pressure So well, that, that thing pressure, about yeah. the concentration, you know, if we have a lapse of concentration, okay, we might get some numbers wrong, which we go back and revisit. But as a dentist, the, the intensity of the concentration required, you know, hour after hour, day after day, mm. um, is quite special, really. And that, that getting into that, that behaviour pattern isn't, isn't always easy and straightforward. Absolutely. I remember getting to an LDC event and what shocked me as well was the fo- I think the whole event was just focusing on improving note taking. And you factor that all in now, you've already got you've already spent, you know, however long you may spend that like, sort of being in someone's mouth, you know, fixing their health, you know, which can be maybe probably quite emotionally draining as well, because you know there's a stress of that person there. And mm. then you think, okay, now I need to try and put on my admin thinking brain and then spend another twenty minutes trying to type in really detailed notes. Mm. And then you combine that without really any breakthrough in the day. You can, I can imagine it gets very a draining um, yeah. on a day to day. So you finish your degree. Um, mm. You obviously fancy being a plumber for a week and a builder for a week. <sighs> yeah, Push, just, pushing pushing those to one side. Not going to make any comment on that. So. What, what was the, what was your pathway into into Frank Town Associates? Uh, so I, I'd always said I never wanted to work in an office because I'd always see the TV shows and the movies thought oh, it looks really boring. And then I came out of uni. Um, I was looking at some different options. And then a, a role opened up, which I went for. And then it was only meant to be a short time role, just to really like tie me over. Um, while I was actually, you know, I was looking at other careers, maybe what paths I could go down. Um, they didn't materialise in the way I thought. I'd, my my route changed. How I viewed things changed. Um, so really, it, it wasn't really a plan. But here I am, entering you know, this is my fifth year now at Frank Taylor. So I think it's, it's quite amazing actually. When I think about it. You know, I never really thought of this being it's a amazing. career. It's amazing how time flies, isn't it, really? You know, oh, yeah. I think five years. You know? Yeah. I remember we had this job. You said, I said, do you want to have a go? And you went, yeah, I'll apply for it. You got the job. And then that was, well, yeah, five years, four, mm. four and a bit years. Amazing. But also that thing about not knowing what you want to do. I think so many people put themselves under pressure because there's all this chat about, you know, know your purpose, know your why, have a plan, have a path. The reality is most people don't have one and that's okay. And even people who 
qualifying dentistry. Yes, they're qualified as dentists, but beyond that, many people don't know what they want to do beyond that. They don't know whether they want to specialise, whether they want to sell as an associate, whether they want to well, buy a practice. Well, we never imagined we'd do this, do no, we? You know, no. I went, what, you're 26, aren't you, Rich? Yeah. You know, when did we, how old were you when we bought Frank Turner's? Uh, 27. So, and I would have been 36. Yeah. You know, and, and up until then, my entire career was banking. Yeah. And then we end up owning <laughs> a dental brokerage for 20 odd years and have built it and yes. expanded it with those other services. So if you'd have asked me at 26, I'd have been a bank manager. But also, <laughs> That's I think weird, quite isn't often it? the interest comes out of the things you do. If you do something and you're you're curious and you're interested mm. in it, you'll find interest in the thing you do. Um, and I think like I said, a lot of people spend a lot of time putting themselves under pressure, trying to find out the thing that really makes them tick. But actually, just trying things yeah. isn't, isn't necessarily a bad idea because then it's you find out. Phrase, isn't it? Crack a few eggs to make an omelette. You're not going to know yeah, what you exactly. actually like doing until you, and also what you think you might like to do. You know, I remember at uni mm. one time I thought, oh, maybe I'll change and learn to become a lawyer, you know, because I'd watch Suits and it looked quite fun. And then I actually read more <laughs> into it and realising that's not actually the lifestyle no. that it looks like. Because that's a TV programme. Yeah. And you're like, that's not. <laughs> exactly. You go, oh, it's maybe not quite maybe what that looks like. So then, no. I, then I looked into it more and I thought, actually, you know what? Oh, it just doesn't seem to me. But it's an issue like, you don't know until you start trying things. And I think sometimes there's so much pressure when you're like 18, 19 to be like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's answer mm. I don't know. I just want to be a good person most times. Mm. But oh, also shit. I think as well, there's so much, you know, when you go back to 15, 20 years ago, your, your career's advice came from some crusty old person in school who kind of pointed you in the right direction of what to do. Where sadly now, a lot of people get their advice through social media. Yeah. So they see these channels and these these programs and these individuals who are having what appears to be phenomenal success, yeah, doing yeah. some quite mm. glitzy stuff. And everybody says, well, I'll have some of that. Want to be a social influencer. Yeah. That's my job, it's so my they, career. But they have no idea whether it's working for that person and, and whether it's truth or, or whatever. I but, keep trying. <laughs> my eight posts or whatever. <laughs> your Facebook, that's so well hidden, no one can find it, including it's, yourself. That's the one, that's it's, the one. But it's so easy to get swept up in it. So no, uh, yeah. I, I think, but then roll on, you know, five years on, uh, um, you've obviously spoken, dealt with hundreds of mm. dentists who are looking to buy a dental practice. And it interests me. So are there some common themes and reasons that come out as to why people want to get into mm. dental, dental practice ownership? Is there kind of a thread as to what drives them to register with us and pick up the phone and, and want to make that change? And, and overlay on that, Henry, is there a, a difference? Because you joined pre-COVID and you've been, what is it, four and a half years uh, and you've obviously got promoted because of you can do more stuff. But have you noticed also there's a change in the way that, that buyers act, behave, you know, little foibles and stuff that you can give some advice for? Because obviously, hopefully, people are watching this and think, well, oh, yeah, yeah. that'd be yeah. interesting to buy. But also, it's quite, I think it's interesting for the sellers, isn't it? Mm. Because one of the things we try and educate the sellers to is what the buyers are thinking and how the buyers might react. But I often describe it as it's two sides of the same coin. Mm. Mm. I think if you're buying, the other side of that coin is, is someone selling and you can flip it back. And I, I always like to understand the other person's point of view. Yeah, yeah. So if you, as a buyer, understand what's motivating the seller, that's helpful. But as a seller, if you know the things that, that are interest to buyers, um, you can make sure that that gets factored into how, how that practice is, is presented. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I first joined, it was a lot about yeah, you know, and it still is now. You know, you've obviously got ambitious, you know, young dentists who want to own practices. You know, want to own one, two, three. You know, that kind of role. You've also got people who just want to become their own boss. You know, they're tired of working for someone else. They just want a bit of control of their life. I would say the biggest shift I've seen in the last eighteen months with COVID is security. That word pops up all the time now because when the first lockdown came, you know, it's most you know, self-employed, they're earning over fifty thousand pounds, basically left to their own devices. You know, they, they felt. A lot of dentists I speak to, a lot of new associates who are looking to register, they felt lost at sea. You know, they were like, I don't actually really, you know, when it's all going well, everything's going well. You don't really think about, you know, you don't think it's going to come to an end. And then suddenly overnight, you don't have a job, you don't have any income. The government goes, okay, you should have enough money to look after yourself. And a lot of people are sitting there going, what are, like, wow, I actually don't have that control and security over my future that I need to. And that's one of the biggest things we've seen is, by lots of first-time buyers getting registered going i know i need a practice now because i need to secure that mm. future i need to have you know a practice that i can you know 
that I can control, I can get loans on, I can start building up my own, you know, using it in ways to secure me and my family's future. Um, interesting, I've also seen that from COVID, there's lots of people who want to elevate, you know, themselves in, in a night where they're like, look, you know, I want to use this because I want to, you know, for the future for my family, I want to, you know, put my children into nice schools, I want to go on nice holidays, I want to elevate where we're going from, which I think is a lovely thing to hear, especially when people take that family element to it. But I think security of their future is the biggest one. You know, the biggest thing that people are moving towards. But you still got to say there's ambition and there's still people who just want to be their own boss. Also, people who are moving away from maybe not very nice working circles, you know, mm. practices. We hear that a lot as well. People mm. who aren't, ha- aren't satisfied where they currently work. You know, mm. maybe it's too far away. Um, the way they've been treated, and actually they want to branch out um, and, and be their own boss. And sometimes they're quite happy just to have, I think there's that, what's been really great is because there's m- lots more buyers, you have the people who want, you know, the really big practices, but there's also lots of people who want, you know, I'm quite happy being a, a single dentist owning my, mm. uh, my practice, but it's my practice. I can run how it is. So it's great dealing with such a range of different people. You know, you've got the people who want two or three and want to start growing groups, but there's people who just don't want their own practice because they mm. can, you know, mm. it can be their legacy. They can see themselves working at 30 years. And then when they come to it, they'll, they'll retire and, and they'll p- pass on to the next person. I suppose that's one of the great things about the profession. It, it affords so many options mm. and opportunities. I think it? it's a real positivity for sellers who who will be listening to this when they think maybe their practice is too small yeah. that might not be of interest. Because mm. what you're saying, Henry, is that, that one of the things, and, and I think we noticed it, wasn't it, the fact of the geography of where people wanted mm. their practices, that, that, that became much broader like house sales yeah and i think what's encouraging for anyone listening is you know you might only have a one chair surgery with maybe Mm. a second surgery potential and you might have felt that it wouldn't be attractive Mm. to anybody because you sort of got this perception that the multiples are the only people buying practice and they only want big ones Mm. but in reality there's a lot of buyers who actually really want (laughs) <laughs> yeah. that, that that they want yeah. your practice. That's that's their their ambition is a one two yeah. chair business oh, in a locality say, that they can the, work the, in. There's the so. right practice for everybody yeah, yeah, in, right. in, in any situation. And that, so the, the, the bit that came out from there was the security thing. And uh, mm. I don't think that would have been quite as as obvious pre COVID. Um, and we always know that that owning a business, owning an asset, does provide security. But I don't think it was quite as as obvious um, mm. pre-COVID. Definitely. And the, the other thing that, that hits me, and, and you know, w- we went through this when we f- bought our first business back in, back in 2000, was that we obviously worked for an organisation, you know, we were employees. And then we then shifted from being employees to business owners. So you could say that we were associates using dental language, and we went from being associates to principals because we were employees and we went to become business owners. But I reckon for me, I reckon it probably took me probably most of a year to adjust from how I needed to think and how I needed to behave. Is that is that similar for for people who buy practices? Are there tips for people to help them transition from being an associate through to a principal? Because the whole mindset, the whole behaviours need to change quite dramatically when you kind of move from being self-contained as a as a as a as effectively a self-employed individual to then suddenly moving into that role of owning and running a business oh absolutely i'd even say you know just talking about using my own personal experience you know i went from being one of the car managers to to, to being a team leader now that is a very small you know I'm, you know my team is quite small in, in the with the relation to the other teams but even then you notice that you've got, there's so many more things you need to be aware of that before you would rely on someone else telling you and I think when you go from that role of being a associate to a practice owner, there's so many things to be aware of. Okay, what your HR contract's like. Okay, how do you keep the staff? Like, how do you manage staff and lead team effectively? Marketing, have you got the right equipment in? You know, all these different, you know, so much information. I think, right, it can be almost information overload if you haven't set yourself up right. So I'd always speak, and whenever I speak to bars who are starting to look out, you know, knowledge is power. The more you know, the better you can be. And it, and it might be that you go to stuff and you read information and you may not agree with it. You may take it on board, but, you know, go to seminars, read books, call us is the answer. Now, I always say to bars, if you don't know how something works, not quite sure, speak to us. You know, read, go, listen to podcasts, you know, 
immerse yourself in as much knowledge as possible, but also immerse yourself in in knowledge that isn't just purely dentistry. So look how you know, look at read management books and other areas that you could use to mm. improve your knowledge and just day to day running. Because they say, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The, the step up from being in it, you know, working and then having to lead the practice, and that's what you want to do. You want to lead that practice. You don't want to be a manager. You want to be a leader because you, know, you can you can that's when you'll see the most success. I think that is it's a massive culture shift mm. and it's something you can't it doesn't just happen you have to i feel that at least with myself it's you have to consciously you know there's something it's a conscious attitude you know kind of you have to live by you know you can't just switch on switch mm. off you know you've got to constantly be you know a leader and constantly be trying to manage a practice and i think you guys will know way more than me but you know business ownership doesn't stop when you leave the door at half five you know at five o'clock at the end of the day you know mm. It's not you can just turn the key, okay, I'm, I'm not a business owner. You know, there's stuff that's going to happen outside of office hours. You know, there's events you're going to have to go to. There's stuff you're going to – it mm. will become your life. So being able not – to, if you're not comfortable with it becoming your life, and that's the answer. If you become a business owner, you, it, it is your life then because mm. especially if you're taking out, you know, let's say you buy a practice of half a million, a million pounds, you've got a lovely big loan you need to pay, start paying off. So there's also – that they've been involved in there so absolutely i think that jump up is massive mm. but it doesn't have to be as scary as maybe as people think mm. it has to be uh, and also you said that thing about kind of it's a it's a step up and i think for lots of dentists they almost kind of it's almost like a, an, an inward pressure that at some point they need to step up and own a practice but i, I don't i don't buy into that do you, i mean what's your view on it is, is dental practice ownership for everybody is that the natural no, evolution for the dentist I don't think it is. I think it's like anything. You know, some people, some people can do it, and some people don't want to. And you have to be in that mindset. It's not for everyone, is the answer. You know, it's hard work. You know, running a practice, everything falls on you if you're the principal. You know, your associate does something wrong, uh, you're going to be the person that has to deal with it because you know you're the principal. You've got to step up. But you've got to say, HR. There's so many facets of information. It's not, yes, you've got the love, you know, for you to be your own boss, you have that control. Obviously, there's the financial element involved as well, and, and you know, being able to say, I own my own practice. But it doesn't mean it's a cakewalk. There's so much going on by that kind, and sometimes there isn't the best. You know, one of the advice I'd say when buyers speak to me, I always go, have you spoken to your friends and family about this? Have you got real honest truth from them about, you know, ask them, do you think I could run a practice? Or do you mm -hmm. think if I could, what I need mm -hmm. to improve upon? Because if you try and rush into it, and, and try and buy a practice and your, your heart isn't in it one when you're doing the sale it becomes you, you know when we if you let's say we've agreed an offer on a practice it comes clear during the sales process you know we're talking you know six nine months sometimes to complete especially say so the nhs mixed practices it comes clear if people's hearts aren't into it because things get slower and if that's the case then then if you know you've taken on a loan as well add that pressure onto it I think you need to know really early on, have an honest conversation with friends and family, look, do you think I'd be good mm. at running a practice? And have an honest conversation with yourself. And there's nothing wrong with going, actually, you know what? It's not for me. There's lots of dentists who are happy just being really, you know, being really good associates. Um, mm -hmm. but I think for those who do want to be practice owners, then, you know, definitely there's, there's lots of opportunities out there for mm. them um, to take mm. that jump as well. We, we're sort of talking, we're sort of jumping very quickly from, Kind of being an associate to to a practice owner, can can you just talk us through perhaps the the key milestones that you need to hit? So if someone's an associate at the moment and they want to become a practice owner, what are kind of the hoops they're going to need to jump through to get from where they are to, to practice ownership? What does that what does that look like? I think you when the first things first, is you need to start. If you're looking, you want to own a practice, find out what you want. You know, right? Where I always say to people, have a must and great list. What is the must you have to have in your practice? Say how many surges, type of income, and then what are the grades? As a great to have it, but if it doesn't have it, you know, have the honest conversations, you know, funding, you know, look at what actually looks like to fund a practice, you know, what is a loan going to be? What's, you know, let's you go speak to financial advisors at uh, the bank, you know, what's that going to be? Because that might change your mind when you see like actually what a loan repayment a month might look like on top of everything else, that may change your mind. Um, I say seek out as much information as possible to give yourself the best foundation, but yeah, I'd say, Find out, you almost draw a checklist of what you would like, your funding, make sure you get registered with as many agencies as possible to see all the practices and start viewing. Even if you're not 100% sure yet, get viewing. Similar to what we were talking about earlier about the job and the fact that you don't really know maybe what you like until you start doing a few. 
Mm. Go to practices, see viewings, build up experience of seeing stuff. So then you can go, oh, I do like this in a practice, or I don't like this in a practice. You know, mm. Those are the, the main ones. They, funding is probably the most cru- crucial milestone in that. I was going to say, Henry, how, how's funding going at the moment? Is, are the banks uh, still supportive, <laughs> still very keen on no, dentists? Yeah. Lots of family money, stuff like that? Yeah, it's very, very strong on the funding side. You know, the banks always have loved dentistry. It's a very solid industry. You know, they pay what they pay what they owe on time. It's very rare that they ever really go out of business. It's a very secure, safe industry. From the bank's point of view, you know, they're funding as happy as ever, you know. And they've been funding ever since, you know, when we when it really got back up and say to July time. The banks, you know, in 2020, you know, it's been funding ever since. The banks have been really positive, in fact, which has been really encouraging mm. um, because obviously that means, you know, perhaps sales can go ahead. So, from, yeah, from the funding point of view, it's as strong as ever uh, from that point. And how bank valuations? I know that you get involved with those. Are they coming in on, on target or are they sort of over, under? How's that sort of working? Yeah, with, on average, we're 97% of what our valuation is, you know. They're pretty much spot on every time. You know, you have obviously the odd one, but the vast majority of valuations, you know, when they get checked by the bank and they go in, you know, within 97 to 100 percent of our valuation, um, which is encouraging from our point of view because it shows the valuations that we're putting on are mm. are in line with what the market paying, what the banks are saying. So from you know, and that obviously means that deals can go ahead. But yeah, the bank valuations coming on really in line with what we're saying because as well they're seeing what you know where we discuss with people, you know. Mm. You, how you shift and you take away just pure COVID figures also with well, the last 12 months mm. and I think a lot of dentists listen will realise especially not maybe a lot of practice owners there's been lots of growth actually in dentistry especially in the private um, mm. and obviously we've had to enter valuations and we marketing mm. and that's been reflected by the banks as well they're seeing that um, so yeah those have been really encouraging as well from our point of view mm. um, I mean the bank valuations being validated is really important mm, isn't it because definitely. from a sales point of view there's no point in attributing a value having an offer accepted if it's not being then endorsed by yeah. a bank valuation. Mm. Because you won't because, get funded. Well, I was, was going to say, and what also happens is, from a selfish point of view, we being involved in an aborted transaction, but also from the buyer and the seller's point of view, it's just frustrating because you get you could be three months into the process by now before mm. you find out that it's gone wrong. Yeah. And getting that valuation endorsed by the bank valuers is a critical part of the step. For, from, mm. from a buyer's point of view, it's, it, it won't be unnoticed by people who are, are interested in buying a practice, but there are thousands of people looking to buy a dental practice um, across the UK at the moment. Um, so much so that there's a huge disconnect between the number mm. of buyers in any given town, county, region compared to the number of dental mm. practices that come yeah, for, for sale. So from a buyer's point of view, yeah, you, you speak to lots of them. What, what tips would you give to a buyer to stand out? Because a buyer could be viewing a practice big along hat. With, yeah, with a really <laughs> big hat, I reckon. So they go, oh, that's the person with a big hat. But, but the reality is they could be viewing a practice with another 12, 15, 20 other people. Mm. So what is, oh, it, what is it as a buyer you can do to make sure that, that, that you stand out from all the other people that are going to be interested in and, the practice? And uh, both positively and negatively. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, I think sometimes people stand out for the wrong reason. Yeah. I think, yeah, on the positive side, echoing my earlier point of, say, knowledge of power, make sure you know what you're, you know, you've spoken to us about the practice, you've looked through the margin information. I can't tell you how many times people go to viewings, ask questions on the margin information. I get a call from the seller that goes, they were asking this information. I said, well, it's on the prospectus. And instantly, your first thought, the seller's first thought was, well, they're not that serious because they're not even bothered reading the market tool. So, mm-hmm. one, make sure you read that perspective. And if you have any questions, ask us. You know, we're, we're here to help. So, if not quite sure, right. but yeah, read the information so you know the basics. Now, how many surgeons have you got? What's your income? Because if you go to the seller and start asking those basic questions, the nine times out of ten, their view is you're not that serious because you're not even bothered reading the material. Um, yeah. Funding, again, have show, be able to evidence you've started that process. I've spoken to so-and-so. You know, I've spoken to David Brewer at FJ Finance. Here's my pre-assessment certificate that shows you I can get funding for this practice. Because that's the main line. Coming back on that point about bank valuations, you know, the main question I get asked is, is their funding solid? Because exactly that, we don't want to get you know three months into a say into mm. selling your practice, mm. then it all turns out actually that it wasn't as solid as you make it worth. So we're really hot on that at the offer stage. So make sure hot that at the offer. Um, make sure you're asking right questions. However, on that, on the negative, there's a fine balance between asking the right questions, but then also asking too many. 
because mm. I think sometimes what buyers forget, and I can understand, you know, you're going to the viewing, you want to find out as much information as you can. But from a seller's point of view, you know, if you see if they're seeing ten people in a day, you know, you might be person number seven in that list. You may be asking the same question someone else asked. And you now I've had cases where you hear people go and they go with clipboards and they have a little checklist and they go through. And all that does is annoy the annoy the seller. You know, they feel they're being interviewed. You know, they feel that you know you're asking <laughs> loads of many questions. And it comes from the right place in the fact of you're doing your due diligence. You know, you've you've been told to due diligence, mm. ask the questions. So it comes from a good place, but you want to make sure that you aren't overdoing it because yeah. if you overdo it in the question asking and almost interrogate people, you know, the, the, all it does is you're going to cut yourself off because if someone else who is similar to you but it comes across much, you know, fr- let's say friendlier because they are more low, relaxed on those points of view, they, the vendor is going to lean more mm. to them even if you may be a stronger candidate because of that initial first impression. It's, it's so crucial um, mm-hmm. on that front. And also, I would say to people, you know, if you do have questions, hold on to them and then tell us, you know, we'll call you for your feedback. Mm. You give us the questions and then we can approach it after the viewing. But if you, mm. one thing I've ordered is be yourself in a nice way. You know, also remember that most times when you go into these practices, these are people's, you know, livelihoods. You know, these people most times have been mm. in there 10, 20, 30 years. You know, these are legacy practices. They put a lot of time and money and effort into building it what it is. Mm. So if you go around and start, you know, criticizing how it looks and saying it needs to, I need to gut it and change it, which sometimes you hear, guess what? The vendor's not going to be one instead of you because from, an, from a personal and emotional point of view, they're not going to like it. You know, a bit like hmm. if I went around your house and started telling you, I don't like the color of that wall. Oh, that sofa's a bit rubbish. Let's get rid of that. You know, I think I, could, I would gut your kitchen. You'd be there going, oh, do I want to sell to this bloke? Do you want to hmm. not, it doesn't come across nice. So I'd say, you know, if you do have criticisms or things you're not happy about don't speak to them at the viewing speak to us and then also mm-hmm. if you have lots of questions come to us about them you know let us be the middle person in those conversations because it massively helps in a successful deal you know mm-hmm. having that person to go between because both sides you know you've got a buyer who this may be that one and only perhaps they buy into the future and as i was saying for a seller this is their you know their legacy mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. 20 30 years of practice s- i suppose it can also make a difference i mean i know that when we when we were much smaller and we were doing it all that you would have buyers or sellers should i say who would choose someone even though they were the same value of offer Mm. but they choose that person because they liked that person Mm. better and felt they'd fit in with their practice is that still the case yeah it's absolutely you know i've seen places where i've seen cases where the high we've had an offer accepted that isn't even the highest offer but the seller's gone i really like them we got on really well i felt they had the same view as me and you know i feel much more comfortable selling to this person looking after my patients than maybe this other person who still doesn't not saying that that person's not nice maybe Mm. a higher offer but Mm. just how they conduct themselves in the viewing Mm. that first impression was so crucial that the seller's actually i lean more on this person Mm. you know and they've gone with that lower offer and say money isn't always the answer Mm -hmm. in the questions how you present yourself how you come across the seller is mm. just as important. I, th- I think the front. take I think the takeaway for me from that is is that as a buyer, you're having to sell yourself mm. because you're in competition mm. with other people, and it's not about kind of being kind of slimy and salesperson about it or being apologetic or desperate, mm. but just acknowledge that you are having to sell yourself because it may come down to a decision on who they think is the most suitable. Yeah, you and good being nice, of yourself, you know, yeah. nice gets you a long way. Oh, that? absolutely, yeah, nice well, and likability. I tell my clients all the time, whenever I have a seller and they're like, how do I do a view? I said, you've got to remember, yes, the buyer's coming to see if they like the practice, but you're interviewing the buyer to see if you want to sell to them. I was like, it's mm. a two-way street. You're not just waiting on, you're not just, it's not just them. The power isn't just with the buyer, with the buyer you know. Mm. You're also there making the decision if you want to sell to that person. Mm. Now, and I've had conversations with people where they go, no, I don't want to sell to that person. I don't care what offer they put in front of me. I'm all, I don't want to sell to that person. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that is the case, you know, and it's just part of life. You know, there's people you meet day to day where you get on with and some people you don't get on with. So I mean, yeah. that's... Are there any things... Henry, are there any things that, um, that buyers shouldn't do where they think it's a great thing, but in reality, it's not a great thing and they don't necessarily think about it? Are there any sort of things that they shouldn't do? Uh contacting the vendor outside of the pre-agreed times is in most cases a big no-no because the sellers like to keep lots of our sellers like to keep things compartmentalized 
They want us to deal with the buyers. And the reason they've restructured is they want us to be you know, contact mm-hmm. the buyers. They want to go through us. When they get contacted by buyers, you know, majority of the time I get calls from people going, so and so's messaged me, so and so's emailed me, I don't want to speak to them. Can you tell them not to contact me? I want everything to be through you. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what the wish from our sellers. You know, people might you know, it's not us being like I want to be in control, it's how the client wants it. You know, they they want to have that separation. Because, you know, come back to earlier, they've got a lot on their plate already, you know, they're, they're running a business. You know, they're running a business, they're managing viewings, so they've got all this going on in their head. So the last thing they want is people then feel like they're being badgered with lots of questions. You know, mm-hmm. so don't contact the seller. Confidentiality is a massive thing as well. You know, understandably, we don't want word going out. So that's a real big thing. You know, if right. we share information with you, I'm trusting that you don't go. Well, you know, obviously, you're going to get to tell maybe tell your bank manager and stuff like that. But don't start telling everyone you went and viewed mm-hmm. this person's practice because it gets around. You know, there's a couple of cases I've dealt with where the buyers lost the opportunity because they broached that they breached that confidentiality. Mm. And the seller for them was a, was a massive trusting point. You know, there's an expectation mm. that, you know, we agree that we're going to keep this on the down low while we're dealing with it. You know, you come to me with questions, you obviously speak to your bank about it or your financial advisor. But don't start telling everyone at the pub or, you know, wherever mm. you're going at the restaurant that you're buying this practice. Mm. But yeah, contacting the seller, um, wasting time, if that makes sense. So if you're going to like the practice, if you don't like the practice, tell us. You know, there's nothing more frustrating than someone who is on the fence. Because I'd rather, you know, us and the seller would rather you come across and go, look, you know what, Henry, went to the viewing, it's not for me. You know, yeah, really nice. I enjoyed it. You know what? Just not for me. You know, I'm not going to, there's another practice I want to look at. You know, if, you, and if you're going to say I'm interested, then let's, you know, I, wanna, I will be chasing you. I want to see movement. Mm. There's nothing more frustrating from both uh, my side and also the seller's point when people, even never let us know what's going on mm. or say they're interested and then drop off the face of the earth, you know, just be definitive. You know, I'm not going to be, we're not going to be insulted if you say you don't want the practice because no, it's no. a bit, it's like houses and cars, not everything, you know, not every car, so everyone, not every house is for everyone. Mm. You, know, you may go see something that on paper looks really good, but you go to see it and you just don't really see yourself there. That's absolutely yeah. fine. You know, I don't need to have super technical reason why, but mm. getting that feedback and having that <laughs> relationship with us is really important as well. No, I think it's good advice. Mm. We're, we're recording this on the day that the the last of the restrictions um, for COVID fall away. So it's the Thursday. And so as of today, there's there's no restrictions in the UK relating to COVID at all. H- have you seen a change in attitudes of how people are looking after themselves or what they want going forward as a result of how COVID's affected them? Has, 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 has that filtered through from kind of a buying or a selling side of things? Yeah, I would. I think from a, a seller's point of view, I think we've seen it reflected in the in the treatments that are being done. You know, lots of facial aesthetics work. I think a lot of things. I would, you know, if you're using you know, people I've spoken to, there seems to be a lot more care about health. You know, how I'm living. You know, my dental care. Because a lot of people maybe not have given it the maybe the, as much thought as they would have mm. done previously. Because I've had quote unquote, you know, they're, they're busy, so they don't have time to sit down and really think about it. Whether in COVID and you know lockdown, I think there's a much more greater emphasis on our on our health. I've also seen a lot more, you know, when you talk to sellers about their staff, the, there is, and it always has been, you know, there's always been a care to there, but it's even more so, and even from, you know, from ourselves and other industries, you see there's a lot more emphasis on staff well-being and looking after you, because the last 18 months have been very hard on everyone. You know, mm. there's no cutting around the last 18 months, you know, for lots of people, but, you know, everyone, has real been a real struggle. You know, it's been mentally draining, it's been fraughtful, there's been lots of worries from air times. So I think there's been a real change, there's a lot more empathy going around, which mm. I think before, and I don't think there was because people were ruder in previous years. I think we've all now gone through a real collective experience. Mm. You know, we can all relate to, you know, if I, everyone when I go, how do you feel in March and April 2020? We're all going to pretty much have the same feelings. We, all, it's a, we have a community to go through. And I think that has reflected into how buyers, because I say there's that common theme of, you know, security. And I think from sellers as well, you've seen how people have brought, you know, people who were going to retire are selling earlier because they want to get out. They, you know, mm. I spoke to a couple who were like, it's actually made me realize I don't want to be working for another 10 years. Yeah. I want to get out now and spend more time with the, you know, doing things I want to do, spend more time with my family, my kids, you know, traveling the world. Mm. And from buyer's point of view, it's almost a similar kind of argument. Well, if I'm a practice owner, then I have that freedom. You know, I can mm. spend more time with people. You know, I, and also I think from staff point of view, I think there's a lot more care. You know, there, there seems to be a lot of emphasis people when talking to people about how, you know, I want to make sure they look after my staff, make sure they look after my patients. And I think there's a lot more 
communal familiar feeling going around. I think every, the last 18, two years has brought people together, I think, a lot more uh, mm -hmm. than maybe initially oh, would have thought during the process. Interesting to hear, yeah. Interesting yeah. to hear. Yeah. Oh, cool. It's been good. I, I, yeah, I think the tips in there are, are brilliant. We, we always finish up in the same style. So we always ask people the same two questions. And the first one is, if you could be a fly on the wall in Ooh, a situation. I'm interested um, to hear on this one. When, when, what would that situation be and who would you be, be observing? What would be going on? Oh, that's a good question. Will it be a history. conversation with his father? <laughs> nah. Um, <laughs> as a history nerd, there's a lot. I, I think I'd love to be with Neil Armstrong when he went to go, when they landed on the moon. Because no one had ever, and if you think about the time frame, I think the first flight was 1912, and then 1969, we're landing on the moon, like in the small space. We're assuming that he wasn't with Elliot Gould in an aircraft hangar in Colorado, <laughs> yeah? Oh, absolutely. He, he was on the moon. He's on the moon. He's on the moon. Yeah. Otherwise, it's one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. But I think that would be fascinating. You know, how was the, what were the conversations like? You know, what was the atmosphere? You know, mm. if I open this door, what's going to happen? You know, mm. you're the first person to ever walk on another planet. Yeah, I think that's just a fascinating experience from everything. It'd be, it'd be an interesting one whether it was as exciting, as overwhelming as we as lay people think it mm. would be, or whether they were so well trained and prepared for function. Yeah. It, yeah, it was just the next part of the process was yeah. to leave the capsule, get on the moon, get their samples and come back, whether, mm. it, whether it was quite yeah. ordinary yeah, for them. Because yeah, yeah. I hope it was a real... I am the first person to leave planet Earth and land on another planet. That you hope would be amazing, but there's part of you that says, was it just another day's work? Mm. Mm. And so that thing where they've done so much training and maybe yes. almost as a, as a coping mechanism, I think like the, yeah. the idea of you're the first person to ever walk another planet can be quite yeah. overwhelming. So you go, what I've got to do is walk down some steps, you know, say a good line, plant the flag, cut some dust, get back in the shuttle, like, make it very mundane. I also think it's amazing when you think, you know, the technology today, for example, the phone is more, you know, has more power, mm. computer processing power than, than what they use to land on the moon. I think that's fascinating as well. So yeah. we'd have to see the yeah. old techno technology. Um, but yeah, that, Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, I think, would that's be fascinating. A good one. That's a good one. I must admit, I don't know if it's, was it scripted? I don't know, you know, the one small I don't small think step. it was. I don't think well, it was. Giant yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't yeah. it? Can you imagine if you'd have made a complete cock-up of it? But mind you, I think sometimes <laughs> those those things, it's a bit like Martin Oops. Luther King, wasn't it? The I had a dream. Mm. You know, mm. it, he had a speech written and there was somebody in the audience that kept shouting out, Martin, tell them about your dream, tell them about your dream. And oh, wow. he basically changed what he was talking and he said, look, yeah, I have a dream. And he did a speech that he'd done a number of times before, but it wasn't what he'd written for that occasion. Mm. And that's become probably one of the most well, famous yeah. speeches in oh. history. But that wasn't, that wasn't the way it was originally designed. Mm. It kind of came out because this person felt that he'd get better engagement by mm. telling them about his dream. Which is remarkable. That's it's that's fascinating. Whether it was whether it's written or you know, yeah. I think as he as he missed the last run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and then our, then, our, then our last follow up is if you could uh, meet somebody, mm. uh, so you can meet anybody you want, uh, fact, fiction, alive, dead, entirely up to you. Who would you like to sit down and have a beer or a coffee with? As a lifelong Arsenal fan. I will have to say Arsene Wenger because I think it would be absolutely fascinating to, you know, yes, you've got Herbert Chapman or Jordan Graham, all these fantastic managers, but he is essentially what made Arsenal what he is today. You know, you think of Arsenal and the first year, so you think of Arsenal. I used to think when he was younger that he made Arsenal because his name was Arsenal. You know, I thought he was the club. I thought he created the club because he was like, oh, his name's Arsenal. He's Arsenal. Obviously, it's just got to be the right thing. Well, obviously, didn't he obviously didn't educate him very well. Didn't he? <laughs> I was too busy with staying up late watching TV, that'd be why. Um, but I think that, because uh, I think in his career, you know, he revolutionised English football, you know, you know, you think when he joined, you know, having pints after, smoking during the half time. Mm. I always think of the story, you know, you got Tony Adams and all those talking about how when he came in, you know, Ray Parler drinking on the plane and how he completely changed the culture, <laughs> which has now gone through everyone else. But you've also got, I think, the ups, you know, you know, winning the, you know, when he first came in, winning league titles, he's also got the invincible, Invincibles, you know, he then wins the FA Cup the next year. And then also, the, how do you, you know, how do you then go from that? And then the challenges of manager leadership with changing the stadium and then going you know, a long time until mm. you win anything really, you know, win another trophy. You know, there's lots of setbacks. But still in that, <laughs> keep it, you know, challenging top four. And as, mm. as I can admit, you know, as Arsenal fans can all admit now, 
I think we all got a little bit too comfortable with top four. And I think you appreciate how hard of a challenge mm. that was consistently to get every season. And I think it's just fascinating, especially as the, I also think, um, talking about how, you know, attitudes have changed within Barton and Sellers, you no. Know, different generations of footballers are going to have different ways of managing. Mm. You know, you, mm. you guys will probably say as well, you know, managing people 10 years ago is probably different to managing people now. You know, oh. what people expect is so different. So they mm. constantly have to keep changing and evolving. Yeah. Mm, definitely. It's fascinating. But I think so your, I your answer is, is over the, the different episodes we've done, quite a lot of people cite um, football managers and people in sport. And I think the business lessons from sport are enormous. And mm. I, I'm always in awe uh, um, top end sports managers mm. that have the ability to manage these mercury like you know personalities and the egos and all that goes with these young the mixture of people, people. oh it, it, it's incredible that they can harness them and get them focused in the, in that way so yeah like I, said, I, th I think he would be a, a very interesting one mm. it's been fabulous Henry it's been a really oh, really interesting on. chat it's been it's been it's been really good yeah, thank you. See you later. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you in a short while. But no, it's been really good. Thanks a lot, Henry. Appreciate your time. Cheers, cheers, uh, brilliant. Cheers. Thank you very cheers. much. Brilliant. So that was, yeah, that was great. That was it was, great. yeah. It's yeah. Good. I, I, honestly, I put his, his style and his approach down to good parenting. <laughs> That's got everything to do with Jill and nothing to do with you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's great. She's a great speaker. But no, nah, it was. It was good. I thought the, the, the takeaway for me was how things have shifted post COVID. And I think having the conversation now, two years on, was quite good because you've got a reasonable period of time to look back. Mm. But that drive and desire for security from a buyer's point of yeah, view yeah. was always there, but I think it's a lot sharper. In it's terms been of brought the focus. to the forefront yeah. for sure. I think also the other things are quite interesting is that uh, it, it, people, buyers, don't necessarily. Uh, it's weird, isn't it? You, you wonder, do they actually think about the sellers as people or just sellers? Does that make sense? Because in a way, what they have to do is to understand that those guys have feelings too. Yeah. <laughs> They're not just selling a business. Mm. They're selling a business, a lifestyle, a staff, a patient list. Yeah. And you need to engage with those people because there's a balance, isn't there, between, as, as Henry was saying, between being like a, an interrogation mm. and an inquiry. But you want at the end of the, of the your meeting with them for the seller to go, yeah, those were guys, those were good guys, or that yeah. was a good person, or whatever. And if you don't get it right, you won't get the opportunity mm. because the seller will just not like you. Mm. And, and and that's suppose, a real individual personal thing. And it's, it's that, that's a that's a life thing, isn't it? That kind of first impressions and being likable and, mm. and being memorable. That's kind of a life skill that you kind of build over a period of time. But when it comes to buying practice, that needs to be kind of turned up and sharpened. Yeah, because yeah, it's definitely. important. And particularly in an environment where, yeah, we know we, we do have over 5,000 people looking to mm. buy practice. And in, in any given year, there might only be, I don't know, probably sub mm. a thousand practices that change hands. I think the other thing also that, that, that buyers need to remember that is there's no point being nice to a, a seller and being rude. To one of the client managers mm. because the client managers will be asked their opinion of yes. the buyer so it's like just be nice and polite yeah. it's, you know ask as many questions as mm. you like I think it's, it's fascinating I think it's like lots of things that we say you know you'd be surprised at how far you can get being nice yeah I agree I agree that no, was really good, really good. Yeah, that's brilliant Thank you for listening to this episode of Dentology, where we discuss the business of dentistry. If you like what you heard, please do subscribe where you found this episode. That would be amazing. And also follow us on Instagram.